Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I'm a statistical geneticist, so I look at my day. My day job is to uh, look at genetic variation in bacteria and actually also in humans and interpret that in terms of the processes that have caused it. So, um, so I've looked at human ancestry. There's also bacteria in people's stomachs called Helicobacter pylori that has traveled around the world with us and gives us uh, stomach cancer. And I've looked at the variation in that and tried to understand it. So I'm kind of, a, I'm, I'm qualified in the sense that I'm the bridge between evolution and epidemiology. So I talk to a lot of people who've been very involved in coronavirus and I, I actually have some happen to have some colleagues in the um, the the Chinese equivalent of Port and Down. So right. it's been uh, very interesting in Beijing. It's been very interesting. And to see I, I'm sure. Happens. And and this is obviously just for for, for clarity and context. It's not not in any way um, <laughs> sort of a demand that you show as your papers. But what drew me to the tweet, the thread of tweets that that you put into the um, uh, ether on, on the weekend was your sympathy for the Prime Minister, which is coupled with a fairly profound conviction that he's got this horribly wrong. Yes. So, and one of the, I have to say, one of the reasons I think that is because I've seen how distant this whole thing has been from everyone in the West. Yes. They haven't, haven't, you know, within East Asia, within all the East Asian countries, people appreciated, you know, from January that this was going to change their lives for a while. OK, but in yeah. the West, people just haven't seen that at all. They haven't really understood what went down in China, what the problem was, why they took it. You know, why did China shut its entire economy down for six weeks, essentially? Um, and people haven't kind of grasped that message. So I think... Boris is one of many people, including, in fact, many scientists who have actually failed to grasp that message, why this is such a serious threat, why it needs to be done. And I think so. I'm I'm sympathetic with everyone. I think that everyone, when they first respond to it, they've got it wrong. I mean, actually, the Chinese yes. response in the first month wasn't very good either, because you, you really have to understand that this is not business as usual anymore. I think once you do that, things can start to change. But, you know, the very painful thing is that the longer you wait to understand it, you know, it multiplies the, you know, every week multiplies the problem. So time, I mean, is, is, is quite literally of the essence. To, to pick up on a couple of the points that you make in, 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 in more academic detail, you believe that the UK modelers, and of course, we're still pretty much speculating on, on what and why they do what they do, but you believe that they've got the numbers wrong. I mean, empirically false is the phrase that you use when you talk of herd immunity, and you think that Chris Whitty um, made a very telling mistake on this very specific issue during his testimony to the House of Commons Select Committee. Yes, he did. So he's, he said that there was 20% herd immunity in Wuhan, um, and so one of the people he's working with um, Adam said Kuchaski. it was 5%. I yeah. would actually say it was probably 1% or 2% at most. But 20% is just so out of the ballpark, it's wrong. And he kind of hasn't appreciated that, yeah, herd immunity had nothing to do with stopping this epidemic. It's clear. Uh, again, apologies in advance if I'm even stupider than I, than I need to be. But the explanation we're receiving, irrespective of herd immunity, is that we have to do what we're doing because otherwise when everybody emerges from, if we did clamp down harder in, in the way that the Chinese have, then when everybody emerges from this quarantine, from these periods of isolation, and it's, it's not far off 100 million people in China who have been in this scenario, then we have been told by our government and its scientific advisors that that is likely to see a massive resurrection in in the virus a massive resurgence yeah, so i think that, yeah so i think an, another thing that people haven't understood is that actually the kind of the thing about the quarantine is that you you should go into it as fast as you can okay but actually you kind of come out of it step by step mm. okay so you know I, I so i came back to shanghai like a month ago okay and yes. 
then, you know, all of the restaurants were closed and, you know, you could go food shopping and there weren't too many people on the streets. Okay. But basically, it's kind of opened up step by step. And really, what they've been doing is saying, well, we can do these extra things. We can live th this way more and it still keep the virus under control. And then you just expand it. Okay. Yes. And basically, what the world is going to have to go through is that, you know, travel will be curtailed until it is cons consistent with being able to keep the virus under control. And it's technologically possible, but we have to reorganize our society to do it. And but until we reorganize our society, we have to shut everything down. And, and they're not doing that yet, uh, although as with everything um, in, in these sort of conversations, it's important to stress that the yet is the crucial word. They could literally do it tomorrow or, or indeed later today. But I, I just want to, uh, finally, if we may, uh, and w but with your permission, hopefully we'll talk to you again in the coming days, but you, you write that Chris Whitty somehow implies that herd immunity helped to bring the epidemic under control. And, and again, I'm grateful to you for your, for your sort of generosity of spirit in this analysis, because you say that you think he's telling the truth as he knows it. So there's no suggestion of, of, of um, uh, malpractice or malfeasance. But most of his testimony, you add again, is accurate and informative. But on this single simple point, you think he's got it confused. And that's why he's making absolutely, an illogical absolutely. false argument. So, yes. So there were, play, there, there were coronavirus outbreaks throughout China. OK, they were more serious in some places than the other. Basically, the the larger the outbreaks, the slower it, it took to solve the problem. Yes. OK, so in Shanghai, there were 300 cases. It was very impressive. Shanghai is a big transport hub. You know, people say that Singapore is great, but Shanghai did even better, in my opinion. But, yes. you know, they cured it in a month. OK, in Wuhan, it took three months. Because there were so many more people. Because there were so many more people with it. Yeah, because they well because because they let because they let it go stages further. Right. Okay. So the, the longer the longer you leave it, the further it will be to come out. That's the, you know, that's a key message. The sooner we shut down, the less people will die, and the faster it will be to get back. And to that is life. that is the World Health, Health Organization's advice as well, and and most other countries in Europe are following it, while the United Kingdom isn't. If if I had to pricey everything that I've learned from you in the course of this conversation, it would be that in good faith, our government is pursuing the notion that herd immunity plays a crucial role in controlling coronavirus, but the evidence from China simply refutes that. Yeah, and okay. everyone who really knows about this outbreak is completely alarmed by the UK strategy. It's, it's catastrophic.